I'll be lifted. Without objection. Uh, Madam President, uh, I rise today to speak about uh, the Military Pay Act of 2011. Uh, we have been on the brink of closing down government earlier this year, this spring, um, and we came to a responsible conclusion and continued our government and we were also able to continue the tax cuts that have helped spur our economy as best it could um, in light of the spending and the debt that has been accumulated. Um, now we are looking at yet another potential government shutdown. Now, Madam President, it is so important that we take the priorities. We know what's happening right now in Washington. Everyone is focused on whether there is going to be an agreement to lift the debt ceiling. Because if there isn't, uh, then we are going to have a situation in which there is a potential for default, depending on the decisions for what gets paid first. We do have revenue coming in that can be spent even if the debt ceiling is not lifted. However, the President can choose the priorities. What I am asking that we do today is set some of those priorities. What I am asking is that we take our military personnel out of any limbo. So let's go back to what we did earlier this year when we were in the continuing resolution debate, which also had the potential for shutting down government. When that happened in April, I joined with my colleague on the House side, Representative Louis Gohmert. We both introduced a bill, the Ensuring Pay for Our Military Act, Senate Bill 724. We got 80 co-sponsors of that legislation. 80 out of 100 in the United States Senate stepped up to the plate and said, yes, we need to take care of our military even if government shuts down. That was April. Now, the, uh, since then, I have introduced a new bill. Um, the new bill is Senate Bill 1365, the Protecting Military Pay Act of 2011. Now, that one sets two priorities. It sets paying our debt, the interest on our debt, and our military. It is those two priorities. Social Security is in a different account and it will automatically be paid from that account. Uh, I actually am co-sponsoring another bill that is uh, also co-sponsored by many senators and many House members that would require that the President pay our debt, interest on our debt, our active duty military, and also Social Security recipients, even though uh, that would automatically happen. The legislation that I introduced in April that would take care of our active duty military is supported by the Military Officers Association of America, the AMVETS, the American Veterans, and the National Military Family Association. The new bill that I've introduced that adds the debt to be paid off along with our military just sets the priorities. And here's what it does. It says that if we have any kind of a government shutdown or we uh, have a situation where we don't lift the debt ceiling and therefore we have to prioritize our spending according to the revenue that is coming in, there are two things that will be done. We want to pass the law so there can be no discretion that you will pay the debts and you will pay the military. You will pay the active duty military. That is what the bill does, simply and clearly. And here's the situation. If the debt ceiling is reached, $29 billion would be set aside for August for the payment of our debts. $2.9 billion would be added to that for active duty military pay. So you're allocating out of the billions that would be coming in in August, you would allocate those as the first two priorities and Social Security would be paid out of the Social Security Fund. So it is a, 
essential, Madam President. And I am going to ask our Majority Leader to let these bills come up, at least one of them that says we will pay the debt, we will pay our military, and we know that Social Security will be paid. It is tremendously damaging for our military to be getting the news in Afghanistan and Iraq of all the upheaval in Washington. Because they're getting the news, of course. And for them to worry, oh my gosh, what happens August 2nd if my paycheck isn't there for my wife or my husband to be able to use that to pay our mortgage or the basic expenses. I just want to put it in perspective here. We have people in the military with boots on the ground by the thousands that are making under $20,000 a year. Now, those are people who are living paycheck to paycheck. They don't have the luxury of having a big savings account with that kind of income, and especially if they've got children, my goodness, they're making under $18,000 a year, some of these uh, younger junior members of the enlisted corps. So I don't think we ought to make them worry for 10 seconds if they can pay their basic bills for their housing and the food for their families. In my state of Texas, there are 28,000 brave men and women deployed in the support of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are more than 97,000 service members deployed who are married and have children waiting for them at home. There are 145,000 troops deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan who are working long hours every day in the desert heat to protect our freedom, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to root out the terrorists that have attacked America. These men and women all raised their right hand and volunteered to go to defend this nation. The very least that we can do while we are in this kind of budget negotiation, which is making a lot of people nervous, I, I have faith that we're going to do the right thing in the end, but it's not clear yet, and we're a week away. So. I don't think that we ought to make these people think about whether it's going to happen and if there's going to be a delay in a paycheck. So I hope that we will be able to bring this bill up. I can guarantee if the majority leader will bring up my bill, it will pass. It has 80 co-sponsors. The new bill is the same thing, except that it just makes the debt payment the priority, which you would hope would not have to be done. But nevertheless, let's assure that our debtors know that we're going to pay the interest on the debt, and our military, who are in harm's way right now, will not worry about their family having the paycheck that they need. Madam President, we have about a week. All of us had hoped that it wouldn't take this long, but we have our, our different views. There's no question about it. Um, I am one who believes that we should raise the debt ceiling only with reforms that will assure the markets, not just for the next week or the next six months, but for the long term that not only are we going to pay our debts, but we are going to bring down the cost of government so that we will not have to raise the debt limit again. We must take the reform actions that we can take right now. We can fix Social Security for 75 years with relatively little cuts in increases in Social Security COLAs and with a trajectory that will put us on an actuarial table for age that has certainly changed since Social Security was passed, very little change. It wouldn't affect anyone who is in the upper 
area of going into Social Security. The bill that I've introduced uh, wouldn't affect anyone age 58 and above. Some are 55 and above. Uh, so we can do the big things that will show our debtors and the rest of the world that we can live within our means and that our democracy can work to do the things that will make us good, not for the next week, not for the next six months, but for our children and grandchildren. That's what we ought to be doing right now. And I have faith that we're going to have to do something temporary uh, for the next few months while we work out the details. But I know if we get together, we can do this. But I surely don't want our military to have to worry about it for one week or three months or six months because they deserve better. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Madam President. Um, will the Senator withhold her quorum call? Will the Senator from Texas withhold her quorum call? I will. Thank you, Madam President. The Senator from South Dakota. I uh, am happy and co-sponsored the Senator from Texas's uh, uh, legislation, and uh, she's absolutely right. There is no more deserving group of uh, people in this country than our military, and we need to make sure under no circumstance are they not uh, paid, and uh, her legislation would do that, and I agree. I hope that uh, we can get it to the floor and get it acted on. I think it would be acted upon very quickly. Uh, Madam President, we, we are a week away now from the uh, time in which we would have to request additional borrowing authority in order for our federal government to pay its bills. We've known it's coming for some time. We've known generally at least when that date is. And it strikes me at least that as most Americans observe this debate, the thing that they are probably most concerned about is how this is going to impact them and their economic circumstances. And frankly, I think all of us ought to be looking at this with an eye toward how does this impact the economy? What is this going to do to get people back to work and to grow the economy? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. The, the president, uh, of course, uh, made yet another speech last night in which uh, he tried to claim the high ground in, in this debate. Um, but frankly, uh, Madam President, I think the, the, the president himself has really relegated himself to the sidelines in this debate simply because uh, many of the things that he was proposing to do as a part of this debt limit increase would be very counterproductive, or counterproductive, I should say, when it comes to the economy. And I, I would also add, uh, Madam President, that uh, the president continues to sort of assign blame and blame the previous administration for the circumstances in which we find ourselves, and, and clearly he invent, in, in, inherited a difficult set of economic circumstances. I think we would all concede that. But what I would argue, Madam President, is the president has made that situation worse. He's made it much worse. If you look at uh, just since this president took office, uh, we have now 2.1 million more people unemployed than there were when he took office. We have seen the federal debt grow by 35% since this president took office. The number of people receiving food stamps today has gone up by 40% since this president took office. He has added $11,000 to the debt of each individual in this country since he took office. Gas prices are up. They've doubled uh, almost 100% since this president took office. And the cost of health care has gone up 19% since this president took office, despite assertions during the debate on the health care bill last year that it was actually going to reduce health care costs. So we've seen all these economic circumstances worsen uh, on this president's watch. And it strikes me, at least, as we look at this debt debate, that we ought to be thinking about what can we do to get out of this economic downturn that we are in. We're growing at a very sluggish rate, a little under 2%. We've got unemployment that's over 9%, 9.2%, and as I said, 2.1 million uh, more people unemployed than when the president took office. And so clearly the focus of our uh, discussions as we lead up to this vote on the debt limit ought to be about uh, the economy, getting people back to work, growing the economy, because frankly I think there are a couple of things that we have to do to, uh, to get out of the debt situation. One is we've got to cut government spending, but secondly we have, have to get the economy growing and expanding again. So clearly that ought to be the focus. And when I said that the President 
in his proposal, in the, at least as, I've, as it's been reported, because we haven't seen any proposal from him, but in the reporting about his discussions with the congressional leadership, it's been suggested that the president has consistently advocated for more revenues, more taxes. And in fact, as recently as uh, last Friday, when there was still, quote, a big deal uh, on the table, we were still looking at um, a possibility of actually striking an agreement, the president upped the ante even further. He moved the goalposts yet again, wanted $400 billion more in higher taxes. And it strikes me that, and I think it, most Americans right now, the worst thing that you can do in an economic downturn, the worst thing you can do when you have 9.2 percent unemployment is raise taxes. There isn't a tax I can think of that will create a single job in this country. It, don't, it would only make it more difficult and more expensive for our small businesses to create jobs. And so that was a non-starter. Uh, and it became clear, I think, over time that it was going to be a non-starter, despite the president's insistence that tax increases be a part uh, of whatever deal gets struck here. But as, this, as, this, as we find ourselves where we are today, I think it's important to think about where we have come from and you know, look at the, 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 uh, the time in which, the time that's now passed and, and where we stand today. And I, I think it's important to point out that um, as we talk about uh, budgets, as we talk about spending, we talk about debt, that, you know, we, our job here is to pass a budget. That's where it all starts. Uh, we haven't passed a budget now in 818 days. In fact, the last time the Senate approved a budget was back on April the 29th in 2009. So it's been now 818 days since the most recent budget was approved by the United States Senate. So we're operating without a budget, and uh, imagine uh, how complicated it would be for any state government, any business in this country, if they continue to operate without a budget. Well, that's what we've been doing here in Washington now for 818 days. So this year, we came around January 6th of this year, we knew that this debt uh, limit vote was coming out there. Secretary Geithner, uh, writes to Congress asking that the debt limit be increased. That was back in January, and at that time the Obama administration uh, also was pushing for a clean debt limit increase. In other words, a debt limit increase that was, uh, did not include any kind of spending reductions or spending reform. Just wanted a $2.4 billion, trillion dollar, I should say, $2.4 trillion blank check to raise the debt by that amount. Well, uh, we came into February of this year, of 2011, when the president, it came time for the president to submit his budget to Congress. Uh, that budget seemed to be in complete denial of the reality that we find ourselves in today because that budget would spend $46 trillion, add uh, almost $10 trillion to the publicly held debt over the next de decade, as well as increase taxes by uh, somewhere on the order of $1.5, $1.6 trillion. So it had more spending, more debt, and higher taxes at a time when we're in economic downturn, we've got high unemployment, and we've got year-over-year -year, uh, deficits that are adding massively to the debt in this country. So the president's budget was, uh, was, was met with a, a thud, as you would expect up here, when it was presented to the Congress. Now, the, um, as we went on in the year, in March uh, of this year, March 31st to be exact, the Senate Republicans introduced a balanced budget amendment. We recognized that in order for us to get our fiscal house in order to start living within our means, uh, to quit spending money that we don't have, we've got to have some kind of a discipline imposed on the Congress, a requirement that we balance our budget every year, like so many states have. There are 49 states in this country that have some form of a balanced budget amendment uh, in their constitution, some sort of requirement that, that forces them to make their books balance at the end of the year. And so we introduced a balanced budget amendment, still hope at some point to get a vote on that. That hasn't happened yet, uh, but that certainly is something that we want to enter into this debate because we think it's important not only to deal with the spending in the near term, but also to be coming up with a solution in the long term, and a balanced budget amendment would certainly accomplish that. On April 11th of this year, uh, Chairman Paul Ryan of the House Budget Committee introduced his budget in the House of Representatives. And uh, of course, on April the 13th, right after the submission of that budget, the President then um, gave a, quote, revised budget speech. Now, it was interesting because the Congressional Budget Office Director uh, Elmendorf later stated that the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, doesn't score speeches. So they couldn't put a, they really couldn't attach a, uh, any sort of numbers to 
the president's speech because they don't score speeches. And we had yet to see any kind of an actual submission of a plan uh, from the president prior to his original budget submission, which, as I said, uh, came in with higher taxes, higher spending, and higher debt. Well, on April 15th, uh, in accordance with the schedule that's uh, required under the Budget Act, the House did pass their budget. And so the uh, Republicans on the Senate Budget Committee asked the President to submit a revised budget based upon his speech. That revised budget was never submitted. You had a House-passed budget. You had uh, the President sort of on the sidelines, out of the debate. And then in May of this year, Republicans in the Senate Budget Committee, and I am on that uh, Senate Budget Committee, were told to expect a budget markup, which never materialized. And so we didn't have a, uh, we still don't have a budget in the United States Senate. The, the budget that was passed by the House of Representatives was roundly criticized by the Senate and by uh, Democrats uh, here in Washington. But it is the only budget proposal, actual proposal, that has been voted on that we have seen literally here in over 800 now in 18 days. Well, uh, as we knew this vote on the debt limit was starting to get closer, the discussions uh, picked up in terms of uh, having a, um, some meetings to determine how might we might proceed, what we might do to, to put a, uh, a package in place that would allow us to raise the debt limit but do it with significant spending reforms and spending reductions. So uh, Vice President Biden, they held their very first meeting on May 5th of this year in 2011, and those discussions uh, continued on for some, some, for some time. We did have on the floor of the United States Senate on May 25th of this year the President's budget that he submitted to Congress back in February. So we actually had a vote on that. And uh, that vote was 97 to 0 uh, in opposition to the President's budget. There wasn't a single Republican or a single Democrat in the United States Senate that said that the President's original budget submission is something that they want to be associated with or want to support. So not a single vote here in the United States Senate for the President's original budget submission. Well, we got into uh, June continued and there was hope, I think, that there would be some agreement between the President and the Congressional leadership on how to proceed with this debt limit vote that uh, comes up ahead of us now uh, sometime next week. Uh, those discussions continued, as, as I said, as recently as last week. Uh, finally started to, to unravel and fall apart, at which point it became clear that we were going to need uh, a solution and an answer. And so again, the House Republicans put together and passed a proposal called Cut, Cap, and Balance, which would have cut spending now, immediately, uh, cap spending in future years, and put in place a balanced budget amendment that would ensure in later years that we had that kind of discipline that is so important and so lacking here in Washington. That was on July 19th of 2011 when the House passed that legislation. So it came over here to the Senate, and we had a vote on it here in the Senate on July 22nd last week, and the Senate Democrats voted to table the cut, cap, and balance approach and denounced it as not a serious effort to do anything about the fiscal circumstance in which we find ourselves. So we didn't even get a chance really to debate it and get to an up and down vote. We had a tabling motion and a vote on a tabling uh, motion by the, uh, the Democratic leader and as a consequence uh, that was defeated and so we don't have anything yet in place that would deal with the debt limit uh, uh, coming up ahead of us next week. So that's where we are today, Madam President, and uh, as recently now as yesterday, the House Republicans uh, have again uh, taken the leadership and put forward yet another proposal, and um, I expect that they're going to vote on that sometime later this week, perhaps as early as tomorrow. Uh, we have now evidently before us something that the Senate uh, leadership, uh, Senator Reid, has put forward that we may end up having a vote on this week, but somehow, some way, we have to get to where we solve this before next Tuesday. I am not among those who believes that uh, it is an option for us to get past next Tuesday and then to try and figure out what happens next. I believe we need to act. We need to act in a way that is responsible, but we act, need to act in a way that addresses the real issue here, which is not the debt limit, but the debt. And I would point out that um, when the President originally requested, and I think he reiterated that request in April, for a clean debt limit there was an assumption there that Congress would just give him a $2.4 trillion increase in the debt limit without any kind of attempt 
to, a, to rein in the real problem here, which is the debt. And so we have been consistently advocating to try and get spending reductions, spending reforms into this equation. The President has consistently advocated in favor of tax increases. To him, this is defined as a, a revenue problem, not a spending problem. Most of us see this as a spending problem. When you've got the kind of spending as a percentage of our entire economy that is at the highest level literally since World War II, we have fundamentally a spending problem. It cannot be resolved by raising taxes on small businesses. It needs to be resolved by cutting spending. And when we cut spending, I believe we will also put in place uh, the confidence that the economy needs to start picking up and growing again, and we'll get the other component, the other element that's so important to getting out of this mess, and that is an expanding, growing, vital economy that is creating jobs and, uh, and creating uh, greater prosperity for the American people. So this is where we are. We're here in the last week. Uh, the President is essentially... I think missing an action on this, uh, his, his proposal to raise taxes, which he talked about again last night in his speech, is old news. It's yesterday's news. We know that's not going to pass in the House of Representatives. It probably wouldn't pass here in the United States Senate. Right now, the simple math is we have to be able to pass something by next Tuesday that can get, or, or we have to put something forward that can secure 217 votes in the House of Representatives and 60 votes in the United States Senate. Um, some of us aren't going to like maybe certain elements of, of what's going to be put forward. But what I can tell you is we have come a long way in terms of steering this debate away from the President's original budget proposal, which, as I said, doubled the debt over 10 years, massively increased its spending, massively increased taxes, and, and from the point where the President was asking for a debt limit increase devoid of any spending cuts or spending reform, simply a $2.4 trillion blank check uh, that, that he would be allowed to raise uh, the debt limit to a time where we are actually talking about significant reductions in spending, both in the near term and in the long term. And whether the proposal that passes the House t this week ends up what we uh, ultimately vote on here in the United States Senate, it is the only viable option out there. Uh, the President doesn't have a plan, never has had a plan. Senate Democrats don't have a plan, haven't had a budget in 818 days, have yet to put forward anything until, as I said, uh, this most recent uh, idea that Senator Reid came up with. But we really are up against the clock. We need to get this done. The American people expect us to get it done. The markets expect us to get it done. Not doing so would put at great risk uh, our credit rating and our ability as a nation to continue uh, to function and to attract uh, the type of um, uh, credit that, uh, that we need to keep our government going, unfortunately. Now, I hope in the end what comes out of this is uh, some reforms that will put us on a path where we are starting to take that debt down, where we're not borrowing literally over 40 cents out of every dollar that this government spends. That's where we need to end up. But for now, at least, we have got to get a measure in place by next week that doesn't raise taxes in a way that would hurt the economy, that, that gets discretionary, non-defense spending, and for that matter, uh, defense spending under control in the near term, and puts in place a, a, a process by which we can get a result on reforming entitlement programs and dealing with the, what we call the mandatory uh, part of our budget. So, uh, Madam President, that's kind of where we've come from. It's, uh, it's been an interesting, uh, interesting path to get here, but there's a lot of revisionist history that gets put forward, and I just wanted to remind my colleagues uh, where we've come from because I think it's important that it informs uh, the decisions that we'll make today. But for the, uh, the President to suggest for a minute that somehow the House Republicans are to blame for where we are today it just is not consistent. In fact, it's completely contradictory to the facts. It is the House Republicans who passed a budget on time back in April. It is the House Republicans who passed a plan last week, a cut, cap, and balance plan to deal with this debt limit. It is the House Republicans who tomorrow will vote on yet another proposal uh, put forward after the President upped the ante last week and made it clear that his, uh, the only way that he would accept a deal would be with significant tax increases on the American people and the American economy at a time when we can ill afford it. So I hope that um, as, we, as we proceed into this, this week, and the days, are, the days are numbered here, that we will get uh, a, a piece of legislation on the floor of the United States Senate that can, can secure the 60 votes that are necessary for us to avoid uh, having to meet that trigger next week 
and to do something that would address the long-term issue of spending and debt, get spending under control, and, uh, and actually, uh, in my view, put the, the conditions in place that would enable economic growth and job creation in this country so that we can both cut spending and grow the economy, which in my view are the two elements that we really need uh, to put the country back on a better path. So, Mr. Madam President, uh, with that, I yield the floor and ask my colleagues to, uh, to, to work with us on the, against this deadline this week to get in place a solution to this problem that deals with the fundamental issue, and that's the issue of Washington's overspending and, uh, and, and starting to rein that in. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Nebraska. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I uh, want to start out today by uh, complimenting the senator from South Dakota. He has gotten it absolutely exactly right. I wish to associate myself with comments that he has made. We are seven days away from uh, literally a crisis in our country. Uh, we are down to a point where it's getting even difficult to try to figure out what the timelines naturally built into the process how you get from here to there in seven days, and yet that's what faces us. Last night, like many Americans, I watched and listened to the President and listened to Speaker Boehner. Uh, I must admit, when it comes to the comments made by, by the President, I don't understand where he is coming from. He talks about higher taxes and more revenue when the reality is that at this late date, uh, he is the only one talking about that. Now, I have been one of those people that has said for a long time, we absolutely need to engage in a process of reforming our tax code. It's too complicated. It, uh, it's almost an anti-growth piece of work. I, uh, I'm anxious to work with my colleagues, but with seven days left uh, to try to suggest that there will be a massive amount of new taxes just doesn't make any sense. That's not in the Reed plan, it's not in the Boehner plan, and yet there it is. Well, here we are. Uh, we are literally seven days away, and as I said, as I watched those comments last night, it looked to me like campaign rhetoric. It looked like positioning for the next election. It looked like class warfare. What it did not look like to me was presidential leadership. And yet our creditors around the world are watching this debt limit debate unfold, and they are as shocked as all of us are by the lack of leadership coming out of the White House. Well, just this weekend, the President was presented with a bipartisan approach. I found it reassuring over the weekend to know that our leaders in the Senate here were talking and trying to work their way through this. It's a terribly complicated issue, very difficult issue. I thought that with that kind of effort, when a approach was presented to the President, he would naturally embrace the approach. With only one week left, that made the most sense to me. Yet, surprisingly, the President rejected the approach. The reason? Well, the reason is, as he has said so many times, the President does not want to have to deal with increasing the debt limit next year during his campaign for a second term. Now, I find that shocking. Since last night, when he addressed the nation, he expressed great concern about our debt limit negotiations being in a stalemate. Yet he could have used that opportunity by accepting the bipartisan proposal that had been presented to him just a day or so earlier. He had opportunity to show the type of leadership our country needs and is crying out for but he decided to reject the plan and retreat to political talking points. The President also said that he would veto Speaker Boehner's approach to raising the debt limit for seven months, claiming that it kicks the can down the road, claiming that that's what it would be. Well, let's look at that. Let's examine what the President is trying to convince this nation of. 
Over the last 25 years, Congress has increased the debt limit 31 times. 22 of those 31 times were for less than a year. Yet the, the President claims that he'll veto anything not extending into 2013. It defies logic to decry our debt and then veto anything unless it allows more record-setting debt. And that is exactly what he is pledging that he will do. Veto anything less than the largest debt limit increase in the history of the United States of America. The largest. His last debt limit increase in January was the largest in history at that point, $1.9 trillion. Yet instead of hitting the brakes and saying, whoa, time out, this is getting us in trouble, the president is doubling down, demanding yet another record-setting budget buster. Now, who does the president think is going to pay off all this debt? It will be our children and our grandchildren. Passing multiple trillion dollar debt limit increases without addressing our addiction to spending does far more to kick the problems down the road. It sends the problems over the cliff, in fact. Yet despite this reality, the president continues to accelerate as we get closer and closer to the cliff. The president just recently said this, and I'm quoting, the only bottom line I have is that we have to extend the debt ceiling through the next election into 2013, unquote. While numerous issues accompany this line of thinking, let's hit some high points. Our national debt is more than $14 trillion, and the president is requ requesting to increase it to $16 trillion the largest in our nation's history. So why is the bottom line only about the length of the extension, not about spending reductions that put our country back on track? Unfortunately, the President's only fundamental concern is how do we kick this past the next election? Above all else, not good policy, not as what is best for our citizens, but the number one goal is how to get past the next election. And this is unfortunately his bottom line. It's simply astounding that the campaign of hope and change be has become such business as usual. Simply raising the debt ceiling absent any meaningful spending reforms just won't work. So now we find ourselves in one heck of a mess. With about a week to go, the latest in the debt limit saga is a proposal that was introduced last night by Senator Reid. But here's why this latest plan has so many problems. Policy-wise, it just doesn't hold together. The plan claims $1 trillion in savings from reduction in troop forces. These savings assume the troop surge extends into perpetuity, which never was the plan. So it assumes savings from stopping spending that was never scheduled nor even requested. It's like reaching into the air and grabbing savings. Essentially, this plan counts savings that were scheduled to happen. Second, the plan counts $400 billion in interest savings on that savings relative to the troop money that wasn't going to be spent, wasn't asked for. In other words, not only does the plan count non-existent savings, it then compounds the policy problem by counting non-existent interest savings on that savings. You simply cannot count savings that were never intended to happen. Now, we're dealing with a ticking time bomb here. We've got rating agencies saying, my goodness, your debt is so out of control that unless we see a plan, 
we won't be fooled by the gimmicks. And yet, this policy approach doesn't hold together. You see, the rating agencies, justifiably so, want to see real budget savings that actually help to improve our balance sheet. Well, Mr. President, we are at a critical time in our nation's history. With one week left, the American people are yearning for bold leadership, not another shell game. Heated rhetoric and charged accusations, they're not going to fix the fiscal situation. I stand ready to work with my colleagues on a solution, and I urge the President to do the same. Let's quit defending what is really indefensible, and that is worrying about getting the can kicked down the road past the next election. And let's try to figure out how best to address this. Now, there was a plan that came out recently. It was a plan dubbed from the Gang of Six, and the presiding officer and I have had some, some interest in that plan. But we all acknowledge that it's going to take time to put that plan in place, to debate that plan, to bring it to the floor, to do the things that are necessary. And we've got to take action now. I'm a part of a group that says, look, Let's take a long, hard look at that plan. Let's see if that's the plan that we can move down the field to success. But we have just seven days left. We need to face the reality that seven days from now, we will be within hours of hitting our debt ceiling. And incidentally, to those who are arguing, no, it's not August 2nd. Well, if it's not August 2nd, it's close to August 2nd. We are facing a real problem where there won't be enough money to pay the bills. Many say just pay the interest on the debt. Make sure you get that done. I'm not opposed to that. Don't want to default on our debt. But that means that we have about 50 cents on the dollar in August, according to a cash flow statement done by the Bipartisan Policy Group. And that means that 50 percent of those out there who would otherwise receive some type of payment from the federal government won't get it because there just simply isn't enough money to pay the bills. So what does Speaker Boehner's plan do? Well, it's a plan that is realistic. It says, look, seven days. We've got to come to grips with where we are at in the next seven days. Or we can simply suspend rational thought, believe that the record-breaking debt increases to accommodate record-setting debt is somehow a plausible course. It is not. I'm more apt to believe the President's own, own words. When the debt limit increase was $781 billion to raise our borrowing authority to $9 trillion, then Senator Obama was in the place where we're in today deciding on whether he would vote for a debt ceiling increase. And he called the situation then, quote, a failure of leadership, unquote. He went on to say, quote, increasing America's debt weakens us domestically and internationally, unquote. Well, we were at $9 trillion then, and really unforgivable amount of money. Today we are at $14.5 trillion, and the steam engine is just firing away, building up more and more debt. Senator Obama's words were as truthful then as they are today, yet now he's done a 180. His presidency has hit the turbo booster when it comes to record debt. All the time reserved to the Republicans has expired. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Thank you. Mr. President. Senator from Washington. Mr. President, I have uh, 10 unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority minority leaders, and I ask unanimous consent these requests be agreed to and be printed in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, we are now one week away from the unthinkable, 
prospect of the United States of America defaulting on its loans for the first time in our history and not making good on the promises that we've made to families and veterans and senior citizens across the country. I am deeply disappointed we've gotten to this point. If we can't come to an agreement by August 2nd, the consequences for our nation and our economic recovery will be dire. A few weeks ago, the Bipartisan Policy Center put out a report that was actually authored by a former Bush Treasury official about what would happen if Congress failed to act and if the administration was forced to make desperate spending decisions in August. The scenarios were really grim. Potentially at risk are the benefits and health care that we owe our veterans, loans for struggling small businesses, food stamps for people who are struggling to buy groceries, social security checks for our seniors, unemployment benefits for millions of workers who are desperately looking for jobs today, and even active duty pay for our military. If the debt ceiling is not raised, we also face the very real and frightening possibility of our economy falling back into another deep recession. Interest rates going up for our families and consumers, millions of workers losing their jobs, and small businesses forcing, being forced to close their doors. doors. These, these risks are unacceptable. People are still recovering in this tough economy, and they can't afford today to have that rug pulled out from underneath them. Many families from my home state of Washington have reached out to my office throughout this debate trying to figure out what they would do if the support that they depend on to stay in their homes and put food on their tables suddenly got cut off. And they have a pretty simple message. Get it done, compromise, and put American families first. One letter came from Ann Phillips from Tacoma, Washington, who after 18 years of working was laid off during this recession. Anne told me about how she felt she was doing the responsible thing by getting herself up, dusting herself off, going back to college. But now she is worried sick because of the fact that the interest rates she pays on her student loans, which she relies on to pay for school, would shoot up if we default. In her letter, Anne made clear who the real victims of default would be. She said, and I quote, ultimately people like me, my husband, my family, and all the people I know who are doing their best every day to make a contribution to society will pay the expense. And Anne is not alone in her concern. I've heard from veterans like Kenneth Huff. He's a retired master sergeant from Olympia, Washington. He spent 28 years serving our country. He told me how through a life in the military he learned the value of compromise and how he's tired of the way the people's work is not being done. He wrote, and I quote, I agree, we can cut back on spending. I know we can do a better job, but not on the backs of the very poor, the middle class, veterans, and our seniors who are on Social Security and Medicare. I've also heard from Social Security recipients like Alyssa Terry from Bellingham, Washington, who told me how important that monthly check is to her and just what it would mean if it didn't, she didn't get it next month. She said, and I quote, Social security is my lifeline. It stands between me and homelessness. Mr. President, these families and seniors deserve to have the certainty of a federal government that stands ready to pay its debts. They do not deserve to turn on the news every day and read about the political games the House Republicans are playing with their lives and economic futures. You know, Democrats have been at the table. We've been ready and willing to compromise for months and months. We know we need to get this done. We have offered up compromise after compromise. We have come to the middle and beyond. We have offered up serious and deep cuts in federal spending. Very hard for some of us to do, but we've put it on the table. And then we offered even more. But again and again, the House Republicans have said no. They refuse to compromise, and they refuse to come to the middle. And time and time again, they seem to be more interested in satisfying the most extreme elements of their base than on finding real solutions for the people of this country. Mr. President, the House Republicans even sent us a bill they called Cut, Cap, and Balance that was not, widely and that was not only widely understood to be a political gimmick, but it had no chance of becoming law. And not only would it have been absolutely devastating for families and seniors across the country, 
but it managed to waste precious time here in Congress at a point when that resource is getting scarcer and scarcer. So, we're down to the wire. Political games need to end. They need to stop finding ways to say no and start figuring out what they can say yes to. Mr. President, the bill that we introduced last night is a compromise. I don't believe it's perfect, but it gets us to where we need to get today to protect families and small businesses across America from market uncertainty, not just for a month or two. That's not what American families need today. They need to know that they have that economic certainty and we won't be back in this ball game in just a few short months going through the same thing with people worried about their social security checks and veterans worried again and the market's uncertain. The legislation that was introduced last night does make deep and serious cuts to government spending. Savings that have either been discussed and agreed on in previous negotiations with Republicans or that Republicans have actually used in the budget that they recently passed themselves. It does protect Medicare and Social Security that we've promised to our seniors. It does not increase revenues, something many of us have argued time and time again need to be a part of a balanced approach to, to a conclusion here. But we understand that compromise is important. So it doesn't inc increase revenues. And that appears to be something my Republican colleagues have almost single-mindedly focused on through this process. So we have given on that. It puts our country on a more sustainable fast track, fiscal track, and it allows us to continue, importantly, to work to reduce the debt and deficit without the threat of economic calamity hanging over our heads like the current House proposal does. Mr. President, on this side, Democrats have bent over backwards to get this done. We compromised, we compromised again, and then again. And the bill that was introduced last night on our side is the fruit of many compromises. We did this not because we think this is the ideal way to tackle this issue. Democrats do want a larger and a more balanced package that we believe will address our problems in a responsible way for years to come. But we put this forward because we know the American people today want results, not rhetoric. And we know the consequences of inaction are too, far too high. So, Mr. President, I call on our Republican colleagues to support this legislation. Stop playing politics with the American economy and work with us to solve this problem for the American people. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Suggest the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.